Howdy folks, Farmer Luke here, uh, saying welcome back to another week of Resilience Growing, which this week is a little bit more of a relaxed setting. Um, I'm not going to be showing you how to actually grow anything per se with any demonstrations. Um, we've learned a lot over the last sort of 12, 13 weeks and um, you should have a lot of things on the go now um, with microgreens or hydroponics or your wicking beds. So this week I want to talk to you about a topic that will start to sort of combine some of the things we've learned and it's called companion planting. So companion planting is about growing plants together that will be beneficial and assist each other in some way, um, be that helping to deter pests, um, improving the growth and the flavor of the food, attracting beneficial insects, um, fixing nutrients to the soil, um, disrupting sort of patterns of sort of repeated growing in the same spot, which can be problematic, as well as creating um, microclimates, which can be really beneficial um, to your growing environment. Um, one of the things with sort of modern farming is we sort of lost this idea of, of companion planting. That's a very much an ancient technique that uh, sort of um, like humans across the ages have, have learned how to do, but with the sort of invention and the rising of big modern industrial agriculture, there's been a huge focus on what we call monocropping or monoculture. And this is when you grow one crop very well um, over and over again in the same spot. And that way you can get a big fancy piece of equipment that does one job very well, it seeds a certain crop type or it harvests a certain crop. Think of a big harvester that picks up pumpkins, you know, very delicately so they don't break and puts them onto a truck to be taken away for processing. That machine's very expensive and so the point of like doing monoculture is um, you want to be able to get as much sort of, uh, value out of that piece of machinery. So a farmer will focus on just growing one crop because they want to harvest it as efficiently as possible. So then when they eventually sell it, they can make, them, make the most money from it. Now that's good in a sort of a commercial sense, but it's not very good for the health of the soil or the health of the plant or even the quality and the flavor of that produce. And it's so something we need to start moving away from sort of globally. This is idea that sort of single crop growing is a good way to grow food. Um, sort of the time limit on that one is up. So we want to talk about how you can start to uh, change that just at a little local level in your own backyard, in your own home. And we'll talk about companion planting and what it means and how it can benefit you and the plant as well. Um, basically the biggest problem with monoculture is a lack of crop diversity. Now crop diversity is, is very key because it uh, brings a lot of benefits to the growing environment. Um, if you have a single crop, it starts to strip nutrients from the soil and um, you get erosion of the topsoil from a large weather events and you need to keep buying chemical fertilizers to input nutrients back into the soil. Now this is not a, a cycle that you, you can continue to maintain. Eventually you'll, you'll start to run out um, of resources to help keep the nutrient level in the soil good enough so you can grow plants. Um, and it also becomes very expensive having to continue to buy in fertilizer to your farm rather than generate it on the farm itself and let nature sort of take care of itself. Um, so when we talk about biodiversity, it's kind of just acknowledging that nature already knows how to do it well and do it better than humans and we really should learn the lessons from her rather than try and do it our own way. So biodiversity provides microclimate. So when I talk about that, I mean there's shade for certain plants or keeping moisture in the soil, a protection from extreme weather and weed suppression with different plants. You think of a real simple example, a line of trees along the edge of a paddock um, that will uh, stop sort of large wind events from eroding too much of that topsoil, which um, happens very often, especially in an Australian context. You see these large fields and you've seen it on the news, um, these sort of dust barren red fields where a large weather event has come through and blown away all the topsoil. But the one thing you don't see is any trees or shrubbery or any um, sort of edging like that. And that's because that gets in the way of planting the crop or it gets in the way of the big fancy machine. But the, the long-term effect of that is when you get a large wind storm coming through, um, there's no, no natural break to stop that wind from carrying the topsoil off the property and into the rivers and away forever. So that's a very simple example of why biodiversity is important. Um, it's also important um, for microbial health in the soil. So you think of a cover crop, which is a, a crop that you plant between harvests of your main crop. Um, that will put roots into the soil, so it will hold onto the soil and provide some structure, um, as well as encourage uh, mycelium growth or fungal growth in the soil. And that's really important for helping build up nutrient and beneficial bacteria, which is all part of that sort of life cycle of, of building healthy soil. Because at the end of the day, soil is also a living uh, matter, a living thing, and you need to encourage it to grow and be healthy as well. Uh, another good thing with biodiversity is uh, beneficial insect attraction. So that's good for both pe pest control and also pollination. Um, a really sort of good classic example of this is a lot of macadamia farms in Queensland. Now, the ma macadamia tree needs um, bees to pollinate the flowers so the macadamias will grow. 
And when they removed the forest to make room for these farms, they didn't realize they were removing all the native beehives that were already in the forest and those bees naturally would come along and pollinate their macadamia crops. So they found that when they started growing uh, the macadamias, they didn't have anything to pollinate and they weren't germinating, they weren't growing. And so they ended up having to spend their own money putting uh, beehives in, interspersed between the rows of, of, the, of the crop to encourage bees back so they could pollinate their crops. And this is a really great example of humans sort of coming in and disrupting the natural ecosystem and then actually finding that they need nature to come and help them again. So um, biodiversity is super key here and that's what companion planning is all about, it's about encouraging biodiversity. Um, basically on that, what I want to take you to is just some real practical examples of some of the seeds and the crops that we've already shown you how to grow um, and sort of tell you some of the good companion plants you can use for them. Now this is by no means an exhaustive list. There is literally hundreds and hundreds, potentially thousands of, of beneficial companion plants and crop rotations you can do um, to help with your growing. But let's just start with some of the ones we've provided you. Um, and this will give you a little stepping stone into the world of companion planting. Um, we'll start with broccoli. Um, that's a really common one, one of the first microgreens we showed you how to grow. Uh, planting sage with broccoli repels what we call the cabbage white um, butterfly. Um, butterfly moth, it, it's a, a sort of in my farming experience, it's a real huge pest for us. Um, it's this little beautiful little white butterfly and it looks quite innocent, but what it does is it lands on um, leafy greens or brassicas, so we're thinking broccoli, a cabbage, kale, things like that. And it will land and plant a little, um, a little egg and that will become a caterpillar and that will eat all your nice big and luscious leafy greens. Um, very quickly, almost overnight, you'll wake up and then you know half your crop's gone and you're like, oh, what happened? And it's, it's the cabbage butterfly or cabbage white butterfly. So um, planting sage there will help stop and repel that pest. Um, radishes, which is another really common microgreen, um, also one that you can use in your wicking beds. Um, it's a, like a root vegetable and it sort of puts this large sort of root down and then the radish grows underneath the soil. And this is really good for breaking up the soil. Um, so then that will kind of loosen the soil and make it really free and, and, and um, viable for carrots and potatoes and other root veg to grow there as well. And you think of, um, normally you'd have to get like a fork and, and really kind of work that soil to get it light and fluffy, but you can let nature do some of the work for you by planting something like radishes. Um, with the cabbage, with another microgreen that you can grow in um, your sort of wicking bed setup as well, if you plant rosemary with that one, it repels the cabbage fly. So again, another example of a herb which has a quite a strong smell, rosemary, sage, um, those smells will start to detract um, insects from coming to kind of hang around that plant and potentially lay their eggs and cause further damage. Uh, Calendula, or calendula is, a, is another common flower. Um, it will actually sort of what we call like a sacrificial crop. Um, it's a flowering plant that will attract slugs and snails to it. And then so hopefully they won't then go onto your kale or your cabbage or your other sort of leafy greens that you've planted around it. So it's an example of a crop that you sort of, it's like take it first, um, it sort of sacrifices itself. Um, and that's okay because you're not really growing that crop for the purpose of harvesting it, you're actually doing it to keep your other crops healthy. So uh, that's another really uh, great example of nature doing the sort of hard work for you and drawing the pests away from the crops that you want to keep. Um, tomatoes is a big one. I know we didn't provide it with tomatoes in uh, your kit because it's not really a microgreen, but it is definitely something you could start to do in your wicking beds as the weather gets warmer, kind of coming into spring. Um, and basil is a really common uh, tomato plant, companion plant. Now, obviously tomatoes and basil go really well in cooking, and um, it also happens that they work very well in the growing space. So the basil will help repel insects and disease from the tomato plant, and it's also known to improve the growth and the flavor of the actual tomatoes as well. Uh, so the Italians were definitely onto something there, um, pairing tomatoes and basil together, because they work well in the soil and they work well on the dinner plate, and it's just a real good winning combination there. Uh, marigolds is another plant that's really good for planting next to your tomatoes as well. Um, it has a very like pungent smell so it can deter insects and also in its roots it releases an antimicrobial compound um, which can stop nematodes from developing. Now nematodes are like a basically like a worm but, but a really a, like bad parasitic worm that once it gets into your soil it will attach to the roots of your plants and stop those plants from absorbing nutrients. Um, I've had personal experience with this in a market uh, farm that I work on and it basically wiped out our entire summer crop of tomatoes and eggplants one year. 
and to fix the soil instead of getting nasty chemicals we actually grew a whole bunch of marigolds as part of a, a bigger wider sort of cover crop that we then sort of plowed back into the soil once they'd finished growing and that helped actually heal that soil and, and get rid of the nematode problem without having to use any chemicals which is really great um, nasturtiums they're a really pretty flower i grow them all over my yard um, they're very easy to grow and they sort of will sort of fall over the edges of your beds and they provide a lot of color which is really good and they also protect from aphids um, which is great aphids are a real common problem with kale plants um, it's something i've had an issue with previously so with the kale seeds are growing one they go great as a microgreen they also get really good in hydroponically or in a wicking bed if you have a little nasturtium plant around that can protect uh, aphids from like getting onto your kale crop and destroying it in pretty quick fashion um, so they're just some of the companion plants you can use with some of the crops we've given. And one sort of example I want to give you of this wonderful kind of old world knowledge um, is a, a companion planting regime called the Three Sisters. And this stems from native sort of indigenous sort of South American cultures and it combines corns, uh, bean and cucumbers. Um, big staple crops in those areas as well. And so the way that they work is you plant the corn in a big mound and the corn provides a stalk for the beans to, to trellis up to climb up as well as cucumbers because the cucumber plant does need a little bit of trellising for the fruit to sort of develop um, so the corn is there and it provides a natural kind of natural trellis a natural stake uh, beans are really good at fixing nitrogen to the soil so by that they actually take nitrogen out of the air and then put it down into their roots and it, and it leaches into the soil nitrogen is is the key uh, nutrient for leafy green vegetables. So it's super key. Um, and and to have plant beans is a really good way to get nitrogen into your soil. And then the beans obviously take advantage of the corn stalk and will climb up it. And then you have nice sort of big healthy beans as well. Now the cucumber acts as a living mulch. So the cucumber leaves, if you've never seen a cucumber plant grow, it has these big wide leaves and it works like a mulch over the soil. So it'll keep the soil moist. It'll also act like a, a weed suppression as well because it blocks sunlight from the soil directly. And, that, and then weeds can't really grow because they've got no sunlight to kind of feed off. Whereas the peas and the corn, they grow up above the cucumbers and they'll be able to get sunlight themselves. So it's really interesting because there was no high tech sort of science involved in this. These cultures and these farming communities knew that this little combo worked. Um, very simple and like big staple crops that were really reliable for them. At the end of the day, you get to harvest corn, you get to harvest beans, and you get to harvest cucumbers, and you didn't need to use any artificial fertilizers or pest control or weed killers or anything like that. You just let nature sort of do the thing that knows how to do best. And that's really what all this comes down to is, um, we're just trying to utilize the resources and, and the things that already exist in our ecosystem and just enhance them and encourage them and let them do the thing they want to do. And that's really a big part of this whole resilience program is learning to adapt and utilize our environment to help grow food, but also help repair the environment itself and put nutrients and, and life back into the soil and back into the, the areas that we live. Um, and that's something I'm really excited about with urban farming. It's not just about growing a piece of broccoli or a microgreen is actually about connecting back with our environment and working out how we can um, give back to it as well as you know benefit from a healthy and natural living biodiverse ecosystem which is really fun so that is a lot of information to sort of take on board uh, there'll be more info in the pdf fact sheet and let's talk about it in, online in the uh, facebook group and in the q a sessions um, we're getting really close to the end of the program and i know it's a lot of content we've been covering um, I've loved giving it to you and I've been loving seeing all the pictures of all your wins on, on, online, which is really great. Um, I hope this uh, sort of talk about companion planning is sort of will set you off in a little little bit of a YouTube and a Wikipedia wormhole and you can uh, start to research and read up on uh, all the different beneficial uh, companion plants you can use with the plants that you want to grow at home. So have fun with that. Um, and I guess I'll see you next week for the last week of Resilience Growing, which is kind of trippy. Um, I'm really looking forward to it though, and it'd be great to sort of uh, condense everything down and have a lovely wrap up and, you know, sort of talk about everything that we've learned as well. So until next week, I'm Farmer Luke saying happy growing, and we'll see you on the farm soon.